Welcome to this week's episode of the Liberty Unveiled Podcast, formerly the Teshua Unveiled Podcast. I am your host, Brad Hopp, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Pastor Sam Jones. Together, we are unveiling Liberty one episode at a time. We'll be discussing the latest in trafficking news, insider stories from those being delivered, and studying the Founders Bible to learn how to return America to sanity and true freedom. Our sponsor for today's show is Teshua Tea Company. Visit TeshuaTea.com or DeliveranceTea.com. Hi, and welcome to the Liberty Unveiled Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Hopp, and as you can tell, my friend Pastor Sam Jones wasn't able to be here this week. So I'm going to continue on with where we left off last week, uh, talking about Jamestown and the Jamestown Colony and the Virginia Company, and we're getting into more race relations, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, I have some interesting thoughts that I would like to share with you on that. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to share some news that I got from Andrew today, and talk about a couple books that I think would be a value to you. I think they'd be a great addition to your to your library and stuff. So, um, for those of you that are just joining us, to catch you up to speed a little bit, my business partner Andrew is a missionary in Communist Asia, and he and the team rescue underage girls from sex trafficking. Uh, we get the girls into our rescue and rehab facility. We literally go into the brothels and and basically steal them from the brothels. Um, so when they leave the rescue or when they leave the brothels they they literally come in with whatever they have on their back or don't have on their back and so we get them all new clothes we get them medical care we get them uh crisis pregnancy counseling if they need it we um you know make sure how they have all the toiletries that they need uh we take care of all their food and shelter and all that stuff then we teach them to read and write and to do their arithmetic and and we um, teach them to work, do work crafts and skills so that they, they have a work ethic and develop a work ethic so that when they leave our rescue facility, they have the ability of standing on their own. We also uh, give them the crisis pregnancy counseling if they need it. We give them, uh, obviously, regular counseling and spiritual counseling, and we share the gospel with them so that they really come to... S- when they leave our rescue facility, they're a whole and complete person. We really look to develop uh, them as a whole person, putting back together the spiritual because there's there's so many pieces that get missed if you don't take care of the full spiritual aspect. The physical aspect only goes so far. The mental aspect only goes so far. You really have to heal somebody down at the spiritual level in order for them to be completely healed. So having said that, uh, back in January 22nd, we had we rescued eight more girls, so that brought us up to 28. And then, as of uh, um, just about the first part of July, we rescued 13 more. We had a brothel owner surrender 13 girls to us because with COVID, his brothel's been shut down, and somehow he found out about us and surrendered his girls to us. So that meant we're really overcrowded right now because we've got 23. Uh, we have a 2300 square foot rescue house and we have 41 girls with two female staff living in the rescue house so we really need more space so we're in the process of trying to find it trying to find another facility but today we had um, a church that was planted by Andrew and the team three years ago that church donated twenty nine hundred and fifty dollars towards the purchase of living room furniture and accessories for the living room and then a Christian businessman there in, in Communist Asia uh, donated $2,530 towards the purchase of kitchen and dining facilities, or uh, necessities rather. And so that's really exciting news. Um, if you want to make a donation towards the, uh, the rent of a, of a new rescue facility, um, you can go on to teshuatea.com, so T-E-S-H-U-A-H, tea.com or deliverance tea.com will also take you direct to the site you can go under the donate page or don't yeah the donate tab and there's a way you can do uh, donate directly through paypal right to the rescue facility i don't touch it it doesn't go through the tissue accounts it doesn't go through our business accounts it goes direct to the rescue facility so i encourage you to stop over and do that because it's really going to be a help to be able to raise the funds to get this new rescue facility so we can start to spread out a little bit and we can be able to rescue more girls 
um, we're kind of at a place where we would not be able to do that anymore, um, even if the opportunity arose. But obviously, we're going to do everything in our power to be able to do that. So having said that, we're going to get into some of the books that I was talking about that I wanted to uh, share with you. So over the last couple of episodes, you've heard me talk about Dr. Scott Stewart. Uh, he was one of our speakers for our church's annual conference called Homecoming. And a couple of the books that I picked up from him while he was here are Dwell and Fire. Dr. Scott Stewart is a PhD. He's a Hebrew, um, Hebrew scholar. He has been a missionary in Scotland and Norway and uh, I think maybe Iceland, um, Spain, and Sweden. And I don't remember where else. He's been a missionary all over. Um, but Dr. Scott Stewart, being a, he, uh, a Hebrew scholar, has really dove and uh, has really dived into the idea of our Hebraic roots or Judaic roots for our Christianity. Because for the first century, most of the believers in Jesus were Jews. And Jesus himself was a Jew. So if, if our Savior is a Jew, and God's law came through the Jewish people, and God passed down these customs that even Jew or even Jesus celebrated as the Messiah, should we as followers of Jesus, who are supposed to be little Christ, should we not at least understand the festivals of the Jewish people and understand the covenants and the and the the um, the the ceremonies of our our Jewish brothers and sisters? And so that's some of the things that are that Dr. Scott Stewart talks about in these books. He's got a couple more books coming out, but these are the kind of the first two that really focus on different aspects of certain festivals. For example, Dwell is really in regards to the Feast of Tabernacles. And he talks about and explains how to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And as you go through, you see, oh, I see Jesus there, and I see Jesus there. And I see Jesus over here. And all of a sudden, it begins to open up the richness of the Judaic uh, festival of the Feast of Tabernacles, or Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, which are actually coming up here in, in September sometime, I believe. Um, so Dr. Stewart talks about a lot of that different stuff in here. Um, so great book. Uh, his other book, Fire, talks about the Feast of uh, Shavat, or what we call Pentecost. Um, obviously, that's the day that the Holy Spirit came down. The disciples had been had been staying in Jerusalem. They were told to wait until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. They waited, and then the Holy Spirit came. And so the dwelling and the waiting, and then that brought the fire. And so it's really interesting. He goes through the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Shavuot. Uh, as it was previously known and and talks about how to celebrate that festival and how does it relate to us as believers today and what can we draw from it so another great book um, as I said I don't have these books for sale on the website but I encourage you to go on Amazon or, or favorite bookseller and, and pick them up uh, the next book I want to talk about is social injustice uh, exposing the false gospel movement of the social justice movement are exposing the false gospel of the social justice movement. I think I said that wrong. Um, this book was written by a friend of mine, Jeff Dornick, and co-authored by several other men, um, including Brandon Howes, Dr. Andy Woods, Dr. Mike Spaulding, Thomas Littleton, Ken Peters, a name you'll recognize here, Pastor Sam Jones, Ian M. Giotti, or Giotti uh, Patrick Witt, uh, Paige Rogers and Dustin Faulkner Schumann. Um, this book really talks about how the social justice uh, movement has really infiltrated the church and it also exposes its ties to the Communist Party and how they're working together to tear down the, the church and to really introduce a lot of heresy into the church. Great book. I encourage you to get it and pick it up and read it. Um, so, as I said, I want to really dive into where we were talking last week, um, going back to Jamestown and what did our founding fathers, uh, 
what was their views on race? What was their, you know, um, how did the charters uh, that the Virginia Company and, and so on and so forth, how did those charters influence America and how did they um, bring about the Revolutionary War 160 years before that event transpired? So, Jamestown, a proclamation of racial harmony. In March 1613, Pocahontas and her husband, Kokuum, were living in a village of the Powhatan Confederacy tribe when she was kidnapped and transported about 90 miles to the English settlement at Henricus on the James River, where she was held for ransom. By Powhatan custom, her marriage ended when she was captured. There, Pocahontas converted to Christianity and took the name Rebecca under the instruction of Reverend Alexander Whitaker, who had arrived in Jamestown in 1611. She married John Rolfe, who had lost his wife, first wife and child during the journey from England several years earlier, and this marriage served to greatly improve relations between the Virginia Indians and the colonists for several years. However, when the couple took their young son on a public relations trip to England in 1616 to help raise more investment money, for the Virginia Company, she became ill and died just as they were return leaving to return to Virginia. Not surprisingly, the marriage of John Rolfe and Pocahontas brought to bear a number of questions. Should an Englishman marry an Indian? Are interracial marriages acceptable in the sight of God? Rarely is it noted that in addition to Pocahontas being the first native convert to Christianity as a fulfillment of our national mission in bringing the gospel to these shores, her marriage to John Rolfe provides a model of racial equality and harmony. John Rolfe provided answers in a letter to Sir Thomas Dale. He stated that since Pocahontas had put her faith in Christ, he was bound together with a believer in accordance to the Apostle Paul's directive in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Rolfe said, Her great appearance of love to me her desire to be taught and instructed in the knowledge of God, her capableness of understanding, her aptness and willing to receive, willingness to receive any good impression, and also the spiritual besides her own incitements stirring me up thereunto. In other words, racial equality finds meaning in the sight of God, not man. The races are equal. This national proclamation from Jamestown is the focus of a large mural of Pocahontas' baptism in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Now, I do want to make a quick interjection here. I will apologize right now. I have my air conditioner running in here. Uh, I had recorded this podcast. This is the third time I've recorded it today. The first time I was stumbling over my words while, while doing the reading was not satisfied with it so i re-recorded it and forgot to plug in the microphone so i had turned off the ac while i was doing that episode and it got hot in here so bear with me uh <laughs> anyway so jamestown the bible and america beyond the seeds of god-given rights and self-government a nation dedicated to god for the purpose of spreading the gospel of jesus christ to all the world and the first glimmers that God created all men equal, there remains one more significant ingredient, the Geneva Bible. It is likely that the Geneva Bible first came to Jamestown with Captain John Smith and company in 1607. Reverend Alexander Whitaker, who came to the colony in 1611, used the Geneva Bible as documented in his surviving sermon texts. As providence would have it, on this distant shore, removed from the direct purview of the English crown, our first settlers were left to study the scriptures that contained the abundant commentary of the reformers, who were beginning to question the role of the monarchy and its practices. One cannot minimize just how profound that combination of these elements was in shaping Jamestown and Virginia, our first colony. The Geneva Bible would be the foundation upon which our civilization would be was built that led further and further away from the crown until one day liberty would be unleashed. Despite the success of the tobacco imports, or of the tobacco imports, by 1621 the Virginia Company was severely in debt. In March 1622, the Algonquins 
the Indian tribe that Pocahontas was a part of, attacked the plantations, killing over 300 of the settlers. Even though a last-minute warning spared Jamestown, the attack on the colony and mismanagement of the Virginia Company at home convinced the king that he should revoke the Virginia Company charter and its God-given rights. Virginia became a crown colony in 1624, administered by a governor appointed by the king, but it was too late. For the seeds of the Christian common law, self-governance, and spiritual liberty had already taken root, and would continue to grow until the nation's independence in 1776. Now, a little interesting side note, I actually found something out to, uh, yesterday, I believe, that was really interesting to me. I was yesterday. Uh, my daughter and I were talking, and the young man that is courting her, my oldest daughter, um, so my probable future son-in-law, um, <clears throat> his last name is Pace. Well, he was. she was telling me that, that his, his dad had done a lot of research and found out that his great something or other grandfather was Sir, or, um, was Richard Pace of the Jamestown settlement. And that Richard Pace had adopted, basically adopted, become, become friends with and essentially adopted a young Indian boy named um, Chonko. Excuse me, Chonko. And Chonko is the young man that we just read about here. He's the young man that gave the advance warning to Richard Pace, who then turned around and was able to uh, notify the rest of the Jamestown colony and save a majority of the people's lives. Even though they lost 300, they were able to save a lot of people's lives. And so I just thought that was pretty interesting. I'm like, wow, actually, you know, we'll probably be related to somebody that actually goes back that far in America's history. So, George Washington in 1732 to 1799. He first received national attention in 1754 for a trek he made across the treacherous northern wilderness in an attempt to prevent the French and Indian War. When his efforts were rejected by the French, war began, and he was commissioned colonel of a Virginia regiment, distinguishing himself in battle. He served, as a, he served as a justice of the peace for 14 years and became a patriot leader as tensions with Great Britain escalated. He was a member of the original Continental Congress in 1774 and in 1775 was made commander-in-chief of the American forces, serving in that position until the successful conclusion of the American Revolution. He was sent as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention where he, where he was elected as its president. Presiding over the framing of the U.S. Constitution, unanimously uh, elected as the first president of the United States, he resigned after two terms and returned to his home in Mount Vernon, where he spent his last years. Called the father of his country by his countrymen, he was usually eulogized as first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Washington's life was characterized by genuine humility and despite all the accolades bestowed on him, he insisted, I have only been an instrument in the hands of Providence. And one thing that I want to point out about Washington is that a lot of times when they were getting ready to go to battle or when they were out on the battlefield um, in between times of fighting, his, his subordinates would often find him uh, kneeling in prayer and praying over our country and praying over the battles and and he was very much a man of prayer. Now, John Adams. Adams began in 1735 to 1826. Adams began his career as, an, as a school teacher and attorney. As tensions with Great Britain before the revolution, or as tensions grew with Great Britain before the revolution, he became a prominent state leader against unjust measures such as the Stamp Act in 1765. He was made a Chief Justice in Massachusetts and then sent as an original delegate to the 1774 Continental Congress, where he later signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a principal author of the Massachusetts Convention or Constitution, 1780, the oldest constitution in the world still in use today. Congress sent him as a diplomat to various European countries, and he was one of three Americans to negotiate and signed the final peace treaty with Great Britain to end the American Revolution. 
After the U.S. Constitution was ratified, he served two terms as vice president under President George Washington and helped frame the Bill of Rights. Following Washington's retirement, he became the second U.S. president. He died on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1826. That becomes a very important day here in a moment. Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826. A founding father from Virginia, Jefferson gave nearly six, deca six decades of his life to public service. He began his political career in the Virginia House of Burgesses and was elected a member of Continental Congress where he became a signer and the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. He was elected a governor of Virginia, became Secretary of State for President George Washington, Vice President under President John Adams, and then was elected the third President of the United States, serving two terms. Throughout his life, he introduced numerous measures to abolish slavery, all of which were defeated, championed the cause of religious liberty, and late in life founded the University of Virginia. He died on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. He and John Adams died the same day. And I, I tend to believe that they... they might have been given the opportunity to pick that day by the Father God. I know that oftentimes when men are advanced in age or people are advanced in age, my mom used to work in a nursing home and, and she saw it multiple times where where people would almost pick the day that they 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 died. And uh, in fact, I saw it with my own dad on the day he died. He wanted to die on Good Friday and that's what he did. Um, but it was interesting. Anyway, so um, one thing I want to point out here is that Jefferson uh, championed the cause of religious liberty. So often we hear this idea spewed about by people that are really trying to um, divert away from and take away from the idea that, that Jefferson was a Christian. They want to take away from the idea that he really had a heart for religious liberty and they really want to try to um, picture him as this anti-religious person who said that there's a wall of separation between the church and the state. That comes from a letter that he wrote to some Baptists in the South where he was telling them, look, they were concerned because the there was... Um, they were concerned that the government was, government was going to start butting their nose into the church. And they were concerned about it. And Thomas Jefferson was like, no, the government has no business in the church. There is a wall between the government and the church. There is not a wall between the church and the government is what he was implying. He's like, we're not allowed to butt our nose into your business. In fact, many of the signers of the Constitution, many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, many of our founding fathers were ministers, and they all believed that ministers and church members had a duty and a right to be part of and to actively engage in government. In fact, they said as much when they said that our Constitution is wholly unequipped and ill-prepared for an unrighteous and unreasonable people. Our government and our Constitution will only survive as long as moral people are in power. It is wholly unequipped for anybody else. And so this idea that our founding fathers were not Christians is, is malarkey. Now, this next section is really interesting, especially in light of everything that's going on today. Um, but God meant it for good. And we're into Genesis 50. As I said, we're not going to go through and read the chapters of the Bible, but a lot of the commentaries that we're going to get into will relate to the parts of the Bible. And I really encourage you to go through as we're doing our reading and go through and, and kind of follow along. 
So, God meant it for good. In Genesis 30, we are in, or we were introduced to Joseph. As a young man, God gave him dreams and visions that indicated a significant role for him in the future. Sharing it in the way he did angered his father and provoked his brothers to jealousy, chapter 37. Rather than killing him outright, his brothers sold him into slavery in a distant land, believing they were rid of him forever. But, in the providence of God, Joseph was raised from that slavery to become the second highest ruler in Egypt. Decades later, when his brothers came seeking help during a severe drought, though they did not recognize Joseph or even realize that he was still alive, God had placed Joseph in a position that empowered him to save them. When his brothers realized who he was, they feared for their own lives, dreading what he might do. But Joseph spoke kindly to them, explaining, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Wonderfully, through the, through the providence of God, many things that others may have desired or designed for evil, God works for good, or God works so as to bring about something good instead. This is certainly true in the death of Jesus. Satan intended it for evil, but God used it to bring about the salvation of mankind. In fact, if Satan had realized all that God had planned, or yeah, all that God had planned to bring forth out of the death of his son, Satan would not have had him killed. 1 Corinthians 2 8. And one of the things I want to point out here with Joseph is your end or your beginning does not determine your end. I hear so many people today saying, well, I'm from the hood and I don't have, you know, I don't have any opportunity and I don't have this and I don't have that and you need to give me reparations because of this and that and the other thing. Your beginning does not determine your ending. I have seen Hundreds and hundreds of people rise from ashes, rise from poverty, rise from being crack, baby, crack babies, rise from being whatever it may be, and rise to places of prominence, rise to being righteous, godly men of faith, rise to being world leaders, rise to being men of influence. So your beginning does not determine your ending. Joseph was a man that dug in and worked and worked and worked. And as such, when he was sold to Potiphar, eventually he became in charge of all of Potiphar's stuff, except for his wife. He had rule and over oversight over all of Potiphar's stuff. And Potiphar's wife got the hots for him, got him thrown in prison because he rejected her. And when he went into prison, the jailer comes to recognize the gifts and talents and abilities that are in Joseph. And next thing you know, Joseph's in charge of all the prison, second in command only to the jailer. And the baker and the and the um, the food taster for the for the pharaoh, they both. Um, had dreams and and they both came before the Pharaoh and, and one of them was restored and one of them had his head taken off and and eventually the, the, the one that was restored to his position remembered Joseph and he talked to Pharaoh about Joseph and Joseph interpreted his dream and Pharaoh appoints Joseph to second in command over all of the country of Egypt and so your beginning does not determine your ending. And I really want to make that clear because, as I said, so many people are, are getting on this poor, pitiful me attitude that what was me? And this really ties into the next story here. As you may have heard it said on occasion, God specializes in taking lemons and turning them into lemonade. Romans 8.28 promises, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. 
and the story of Phyllis Wheatley, 1753 to 1784, is a clear demonstration of this truth. Born in Senegal, Africa, she was kidnapped when eight and sent on a slave ship to Boston, where she was purchased to be a family servant by a prosperous tailor, John Wheatley. But Susanna, his wife, considered Phyllis a daughter, and Mary, his own daughter, treated her like a sister. Both Susanna and Mary tutored her, and within 16 months, Phyllis had so mastered her new language of English that she was able to easily read the most difficult parts of the Bible with ease. Mary also taught Phyllis astronomy, geography, ancient history, the Latin classics, and the English poets, all of which she conquered with great or with equal ease. Because of her aptitude for difficult knowledge and her ability as a brilliant conversationalist, Bostonian intellectuals consider her a child prodigy. When she was 13, she wrote her first poetic verses, and three years later penned a poem about the celebrated, celebrated Reverend George Whitfield, whom she greatly admired. In 1771, she confirmed her faith in Christ and was baptized in the famous Old South Church. In 1773, her health began to fail, and a sea voyage was recommended as a curative. The Wheatleys promptly freed her, and she traveled to England, where she was received by British royalty. Phyllis's early interest in poetry remained while abroad, and while abroad, she published her first collection of poems, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, is the title of it. In 1775, while still abroad, providentially, while the, stage, or while the siege of Boston was underway in America, she wrote a letter to the new commander-in-chief, General Washington, including a special poem she had written for him. Washington was so deeply moved that when Phyllis returned, he invited her to his military encampment at Cambridge to honor her before his staff and to have her read poetry to his officers. In 1778, she married John Peters, who appeared a promising young man, but actually had a deeply flawed character. He was slothful, did not provide for his new wife, and failed to give her the care that her delicate health required, finally deserting her. Five years later, when she was only 30 years old, she died in poverty and was buried in an unmarked grave. And of her three children, two died in infancy, and the third was buried alongside her. Was Phyllis bitter about the many apparent tragedy, tragedies in her life? No, she never complained. In fact, she even saw a divine lining to the fact that she had been kidnapped as a young girl, acknowledging, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there is a God, that there is a Savior too, once I have redemption neither sought nor knew. What Satan had planned for, des for her destruction, God used for her redemption. Phyllis, like Joseph long before, recognized that God had taken what was intended for evil and turned it into something good, for which she was eternally grateful. Phyllis was America's first black poetess and her works remain popular to this day. She is a shining example of the devout Christian and an accomplished poet and a gracious and kind woman. Exodus. I'm going to read. I always try to read the beginnings of the of the the um, the opening synopsis of the of the books of the Bible, so you can really kind of, as you're doing your own personal Bible study about Exodus or Genesis or whatever, there's some truths that you can draw out from the first part of the synopsis here, and I think it's really valuable. So the author of Exodus is Moses, and it was written about 1400 B.C. The purpose of Exodus means going out. This is the book that records the deliverance of the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt, God unveiling his name, the dethroning of Egypt's false gods with the plagues, the Passover, the journey to Mount Sinai, God's desire to speak to everyone, the Ten Commandments, establishing the covenant, the revelation of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the people's sin in fashioning a golden calf, and Moses' intercession. This is the story of God as our deliverer, his long to reveal himself as the one who desires to dwell in our midst, and our longing and challenge to know that. The journey begins with God coming to rescue and deliver us. 
the key verses. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, but to a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3, 8. Excuse me. If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord our God and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Something I'm going to point out here real quick. For I, the Lord, am your healer. The scripture says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God is our healer yesterday, he's our healer today, and he will be our healer in the future. In the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about how in the, in the New Jerusalem, the nations, that serve, the people, the natural people that survived the tribulation, because there will be, people, will be natural people that survived the tribulation and get to come into the New Jerusalem. And they will get to eat of the fruit of the trees along the river's edge for the healing of the nations. So he's our healer back then. He's our healer today. So if you're needing healing, believe for it. Believe for healing from him. He is our healer. I don't know why I felt like I needed to say that, but I think someone needs to hear that. God is our healer. He wants to see you healed. It is not God's will that anybody be sick. If that was the case, he would have never said, I'm your healer. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When, Rose, when Moses returned to the camp, his son or his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Exodus 33, 11. Now, there are, now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Exodus thirty-three thirteen, And the key people in this book are Moses, Pharaoh, Aaron, Miriam, Jethro, Joshua, and Bezalel. American Slavery, the Beginning of the End at the time of the American founding, slavery had become a largely regional issue. Generally, those in the northern colonies strongly opposed it, those in the southern colonies strongly supported it, and those in the middle colonies contained segments of population representing both views. At the Constitutional Convention, the majority of the founding fathers, the majority of the founding fathers were anti-slavery. But, in a concession to the southern states, in the new United States, slavery was not abolished by the United States Constitution, even though delegates such as George Mason of Virginia had urged, as much as I value a union of all the states, I would not admit the southern states into the union unless they agree to the discontinuation of this disgraceful trade or slavery. Mason's view did not prevail, but because the overwhelming uh, majority of the delegates did recognize that slavery was wrong, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution therefore included a provision allowing Congress to ban the importation of all slaves after the year 1808. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the Constitutional Convention, it was believed that within 20 years, the southern states would be ready to relinquish slavery, and this law would pave the way. In the meantime, remember, they're in a complicated time. They're trying to set up a new nation. They're trying to make sure that all the states are there so that they have enough population base that they can defend the new nation. So this is a complicated time. They're going through a lot right now. In the meantime, Congress did what it could to limit slavery. In 1789, it banned slavery in the Northwest Territory, thus admitting Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin into the United States as anti-slavery states. 
1794, it banned the exportation of slaves out of the United States into any other nation. Then in 1807, as the long-awaited constitutionally designated year drew near, Congress passed a measure banning the importation of any slaves into America, and President Thomas Jefferson promptly signed the law that, as permitted by the Constitution, would take effect the first moment of 1808. On that momentous day, January 1st, 1808, a famous sermon was delivered by the Reverend Absalom Jones, America's first black Episcopalian priest in Philadelphia at the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas. Significantly, that church was built under the leadership of Jones as well as signer of the Declaration, Benjamin Rush, a founder of America's first abolition society, and the Reverend Richard Allen, a famous black minister who regularly preached at the large white megachurch, or at a large white megachurch, before he started his famous Bethel Church and birthed the AME denomination. Jones's sermon was powerful, and he began it with Exodus 3, 7-8. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows and I am come down to deliver them. These words, my brethren, contain a short account of some of the circumstances which preceded the deliverance of the children of Israel from their captivity and bondage. They mention in the first place their affliction. Our text mentions in the second place that in this situation they were not forgotten by the God of their fathers and the father of the human race. Our text tells us that he saw their affliction and heard their cry and came down from heaven in his own person in order to deliver them. The God of heaven and earth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8 He has seen the affliction of our countrymen with an eye of pity. He has seen the anguish which has been taken or which has taken place when parents have been torn from their children and when children from their parents and conveyed with their hands and feet bound in fetters on board ships prepared to receive them. He has seen them exposed for sale like horses and cattle upon the wharves. Their cries and shrieks, they have been heard in heaven. The ears of Jehovah have been constantly open to them. He has heard the prayers that have ascended to him from the hearts of his people. And he has as in the case of his ancient and chosen people, the Jews, come down to deliver our suffering countrymen from the hands of their oppressors. He came down into the Congress of the United States last winter when they passed the same, a similar law, the operation of which commences on this happy day. Let the, songs of angel, or let the song of angels, which was first heard in the air at the birth of our Savior, Luke 2, 13-14, be heard this day in our assembly. Let us sing songs under, or psalms under him and talk of all his wondrous works. Psalm 105, verse 2. Let the 1st of January, the day of the abolition of the slave trade in our country, be set apart in every year as a day of public thanksgiving. And when they, our children, shall ask in time to come, saying, What mean the lessons, the psalms, the prayers, and the praises in worship of this day? Exodus 12, 26 to 27, Joshua 4, 6 and 7, and Deuteronomy 6, 20 through 25. Let us answer them by saying, The Lord, on the day of which this is the anniversary, abolished the trade which dragged, our father, which dragged your fathers from their native country and sold them as bondmen in America. From that day in 1808 until the complete abolition of slavery by Congress, with his passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865, the first day of January was annually celebrated in black churches as a day of thanksgiving to God. And it's important to note that slavery is a modern day issue. Yes, we did away with slavery in our country 160 years ago, but it's still active and still resident in many nations of the world tonight. It's going on in Muslim countries. It's going on in Africa. It's going on in Asia. It's going on all over the world. It's going on right here in America through the sex trade. 
and we can be modern day abolitionists by helping our brothers and sisters come out of the sex trade, by helping them, by helping organizations like Teshua Tea Company and Teshua House to rescue girls out of the sex trade. We can do a lot of things in this modern day right now to end or help end slavery in the world, but we can't do it on our own. We have to have your help. And so, as I said earlier in the show, I encourage you to go to TeshuaT.com to or DeliveranceT.com. Go to the donate page. And 5 or $10 or $20 or whatever, if you can do it on a monthly basis, do it on a monthly basis. But you're already buying, you know, you're spending $30 or $40 probably a month or more. Probably more like $100 a month on Starbucks coffee or whatever, you know, and a, to a company that supports abortion, why not put some of that money, instead of supporting them, put some of that money towards buying some of the coffee and supporting the girls that way, but then put some of the rest of it towards a donation towards Teshua. And so we can get the girls, you know, to spread out into a couple different houses and so that we can rescue more girls. So... Thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the show today. I really appreciate it. Pastor Sam will be here next week, um, and we'll continue on from there. But it really does mean a lot to me that you guys tune in and listen to the show. Please like and subscribe, and take the time to share the show with your friends. Please. It really, really means a lot to me. Um, you know, we're we're starting to climb up in, in the listens and, and downloads and whatnot. And, you know, um, if you listen to us on YouTube, you know that we are on uh, Spotify and iTunes and iHeartRadio and TuneIn and Stitcher and several other your favorite podcast players. We're not on Pandora yet. We've submitted our podcast, but they are slower than the seven-year itch. I don't know why they're taking forever to to get us on there, but they are. Um, one of the changes that you will be seeing probably over the, or actually you will be seeing over the next week or so, um, is I have found an application that I am going to be able to have a podcast player right on the Tishuat.com site for the podcast and a player for the YouTube, so I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna still keep the Liberty Unveiled uh, page active for now, but I'm gonna transition everything over to the Tishua un- or to the Tishua Tea Company site, so that everything's a little more kind of cohesive, and you can go right on there, and you can watch the podcast, or you can listen to them on on the podcast player. So, anyway. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. I really appreciate it. Have a blessed day. Love you all. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Liberty Unveiled podcast, setting captives free one episode at a time. The Liberty Unveiled podcast is a part of the Unresolved Podcast Network and has been brought to you by Teshua Tea Company, T-E-S-H-U-A-H-T-E-A.com or DeliveranceTea.com.